Welcome to Barriers to Entry, the new podcast where every episode we're going to get into it with the leaders, the designers, the early adopters, and the influencers who are helping to shape what Web3, the metaverse, the blockchain, and more will mean for the architecture and design industry. I'm Bobby Bonet, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Andrew Lane and Tess Bain. Welcome, welcome. Thanks, Bobby. It's great to be here, and we're so excited for the first episode. Because it's our first episode, I'd love to share with our listeners a little bit about Andrew and Tess and Digby. So do you all mind filling in on where you come from and where your credentials are that would make you the right two parts of the tri-hosts of Barriers to Entry? So my background's in the design and architecture industries. I've always worked on behalf of manufacturers or for dealers in either textiles or in furniture. My passion for authentic design, specifically, I'm a huge fan of authentic design furniture, was a really natural sort of foray into this space when we first kind of discovered about a year ago all of the new technology in Web3 and thinking about how can we bring that technology to the design industry. For me, my dad used to broadcast the local hockey team on Access Cable. and I, get, I didn't know to, that. Yeah, I used to help out with that back in the day. So my podcast trajectory really started on uh, local cable in rural Ontario, Canada. So I don't know if you can think of a more appropriate rise from that, but if I need any other credentials, I was uh, doing an awful lot of work at the dawn of Web2, really helping brands and businesses to make their first mark in that space. And when we started Digby, we said, you know, this is an opportunity in Web3 as well. So Tess's background in the industry and, and mine and the technology side felt like a good pairing. But what about you, Bobby? How did you get here? I'm leading digital and strategic growth at Sandow Design Group, which is a multi-platform collective of media services and networks brands in the architecture and design industry. Two of those brands are closely tied into this podcast. One is the studio by Sandow, a creative production studio, which is producing the show. And one is the Surround Podcast Network, a collective of podcasts from the architecture and design industry. And Barriers to Entry is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Networks. So that's really where we are here is we've got the industry expert, the tech slash local cable expert, and then the plugs guy. And we hope that that balance is really going to bring you some entertainment. But most importantly, bring you great conversations with some exciting guests. And so really to get us started this week, we couldn't be more excited for our first guest. You know, she has been so well known in our industry. She was the founder of a major independent media outlet. She's now actually working in the Web3 space. And if you're doing anything on LinkedIn in either the design or the Web3 industry right now, there's a good chance she's commenting on your posts and or resharing them. We're really excited to have Jamie Derringer joining us. We were just super excited to be able to to, to track her down and, and to sit down with her. So we're excited to share with you the interview now, which was taped at Pen One in New York City. So enjoy. So we're so excited to bring on our guest today. She is the founder of Design Milk, which many of you will know. She is currently the head of community at Tonic, which we'll get into a little bit more further. And She's also our LinkedIn follow of the month. So we're very excited to have Jamie Derringer join us on the pod today. Welcome, Jamie. Oh, so great to be here. Thanks for having me. We know that you've been an entrepreneur in this space for some time. You started Design Milk back in 2006. I almost said way back. I don't want to. Well, it is way, way back. Is it way now? Way, way. Oh, geez. Yeah. I heard recently that they're calling people who did things in the 1990s as people from the 1900s. Oh, so, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But 2006 is pretty modern compared to that. That was right in the heart of the Web 2 revolution. Can you tell us about the lay of the land at that point in time and how you're seeing similarities to where we are today? Yes, I started Design Milk. It was Web 2, but it was early Web 2. So at the time of, you know, Blogger, very early days of Facebook and Twitter. And there was a lot of excitement. I mean, when I started Design Milk, there were not a whole lot of people publishing online. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knew what I was doing didn't really understand blogging. In fact, my husband called it me playing on the internet. That was like his, yeah. And I was like, no, wait, this is going to be my job. Just wait. And that's kind of how I'm feeling today with Web3. So it's it parallels that in the sense of like, there's a lot of new roads to be paved and new and exciting things that are going to happen. And I love being at the start of that. So Jamie, tell us about Jamie 3.0, because I know you've developed that persona for yourself. It was kind of accidental, came about in a conversation with a friend talking about Web 1. 
Web 2 and Web 3. My Web 1 was just education and growing up. Web 2 was me finding myself, starting a business, selling that business. And Jamie 3 is, I'm not really sure yet. I'm just really excited about what's next. Well, I would imagine part of that excitement comes from the fact that you are unsure about what Jamie 3 might be, which is similar to where we sit as it relates to what Web 3 is going to be. Absolutely. And I think that that, to me, is the most exciting part of all of this. Curiosity has really been at the heart of what I do and who I am as a person. And so not knowing and being curious and experimenting and just trying to figure out what's going to happen, to me, is like what keeps me going. I love your story about your husband and you talked about, you know, this is going to be my job someday. Can you talk a little bit about what that feeling is to just have that certainty amidst uncertainty? I do a lot of things in my life going by my gut. So I don't even know like where it comes from, but it is just a feeling that I start to get kind of tingly and excited and I want to talk to people and I want to ask a lot of questions and I want to fill my brain with new information that I know nothing about and explore new territories. And that's where I'm at right now. I think when you get out and you're early to something and you start to find those people that you can communicate with, that community that you can build, it gets really exciting. What are some of those other parallels that you're kind of feeling to the way Web2 rose up to what we're seeing right now? Yeah, there was just a lot of exploration. There were a lot of companies just trying new things, throwing things at the wall, seeing what stuck, a lot of collaboration. And I think that that's also what we're seeing here. Nobody really knows what Web3 is. And I think that that's okay. A playbook can sometimes be quite boring. Well, I like looking at things from the perspective of being like an outsider. I like to come in not knowing anything and ask the questions that other people might not be thinking about or asking. And I think when there is a blank slate or a blank canvas, it's like you can just ask all of the questions. Speaking on that, about being early, we all kind of have this conversation. You know, it's an easy thing to say in the industry right now is like, oh, we're very early. So I want to get your take on that, too. But specific to the architecture and design community, why is it important to be early? I think being an early adopter, we've seen this on social media platforms as you get more followers if something starts to take off. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing is like growing your audience and growing in a very rapid way. But I also think that being early helps you become a leader faster because people will look to you as to, you know, some people really need a playbook and they want somebody to follow. Mm -hmm. So being able to be at the forefront of that and leading this charge into this new and new territory that you're exploring, even though you don't have all the answers, other people think that you do. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can carve out like a path. For others. I think that's the dirty secret, right? Is the people who think think someone's a leader, but really they're just kind of figuring it out as well. They're just maybe good about keeping more tight lipped about it. I mm-hmm. think that's what's exciting in these times is it's a chance for leaders to emerge, but we don't know where they're gonna quite come from all the time. And really now it's like anybody's game, right? Anybody can jump in right now. Just like in 2006, anybody could start a blog. I think it's a good segue into our LinkedIn influencer of the month convo because you've certainly used this as an opportunity to really get out there. What have you learned? from putting yourself out there? Well, first of all, LinkedIn to me is quite new as a community. I didn't really post much on LinkedIn and now I'm on there all the time. And it's becoming a really exciting place to be. There's a lot of people doing new things on LinkedIn. And so just being able to get out there and ask questions and be able to be seen by professionals in design or in Web3 or in technology and then follow other leaders and just keep tabs on what they're doing and what kind of conversations they're having, what kind of news they're seeing. It's a really awesome way to connect with other professionals, but it's like way more fun, I think, than it used to be. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say, I feel like LinkedIn, if you would ask them in 2006, if they were going to be the fun, exciting place to be, I don't know how many many people would have predicted that, but it's really interesting what that platform itself has just evolved itself into and that there's these tools that now exist on the back of Web2 to help build new opportunities in new spaces. One thing you'd shared over the summer is that you feel as though, and I'm going to quote you, Jamie, social media is dead and it's effectively being replaced by recommendation media and other other kind of sub formats within social media. (laughs) Very bold. (laughs) But you did ask whether Web3 could be a solution to fix where social media evolved or maybe devolved to. So where and why and how do you feel Web3 may be a solution in getting us back to 
the glory days, if you will, of social media? There's a couple of things. The first thing I would say is that with Web3, there's a migration to um, more ownership over your community. So instead of being beholden to Facebook and whatever they decide to do, you know, corporate strategy or algorithm changes that could potentially disrupt or even end your business overnight, you move your community somewhere where you have total ownership over that community. And then you can bring them wherever you want to. And I think that putting the hands back into the creators, the entrepreneurs, the companies, instead of being beholden to these large corporations that really don't care about small business growth or small communities, I think that's really important. So that's one big part of it that I think is super important. And then I forgot the second part of the well, thing I, think I was going to say. we can lean say. into that first part because <laughs> it was a really good one, like this idea of a true, uh, like authentic collaboration and community is something that obviously resonates with our industry as well. That was something that Web2 always had as its headline, but it never really lived up to the promise because I think that those companies got too big too fast, but they were definitely big. You actually reminded me of my second point, which was, that was my plan. decentralization. This worked out really great. Web3, one of the components, it's a little idealistic, but the idea of decentralized communities so that the community has a little bit more ownership over what happens to the company or the brand or the community as it grows, making decisions with your community, having them invest time and energy in the things that they want to see instead of what you think they want. So I, I love that idea. It won't work for everybody, but I still think there's just something, there's a lot of like power to the people. And I, I love that. I don't know if you can own that quote, but. <laughs> no, I don't. Do you see an application for that in the A&D community? Like, I'm interested to see where decentralization plays there. A hundred percent. I do. So from a decentralization perspective, this leads me into what we're doing at Tonic, which is building an interior designer community or a community around interior design lovers and professionals. We're working with them to teach them and help them learn about Web3, mm -hmm. NFTs, metaverse, all of the things that are happening or going to be happening. And we're all holding our hands together and saying, let's figure this out as we go. We don't have an answer for them right now, but we know it's going to happen. And we're all going to have to get there at some point. So why not have them come on board now mm -hmm. and we'll figure it out together. And mm -hmm. that's building a community. And to me, that's, that's decentralization in a way. It's such an interesting approach, too. And it's one of the things that I loved about our early conversations together, too, was your ability to say, you know what, I don't know. And I'm comfortable saying I don't know everything, but I'm here to learn. And I think it creates a really open and welcoming space. Yeah, we're all here to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the idea is here, like, let's learn this together and figure out what the industry needs. Just think about the power of the designer. If you think about the metaverse, right, you're talking about a space that doesn't really exist physically. So the opportunities are limitless and you can create whatever you mm -hmm. want. So the possibilities for expanding businesses, growing new ways of uh, new revenue streams, a new economy, mm -hmm. there's so much excitement, but there's a lot to be built there. And designers need to be at the front line of this, not waiting at the end to figure out what's left over. And I think with the design community, a lot of times they're the last to adopt technology. And so what I really want to do is get them a step ahead. Because I think we need as a design community to shape what these experiences look like, feel like. How can we incorporate things like wellness, sustainability into the metaverse? Yeah, really well said. I think that that's one of the things that is the hardest to get to is that where everyone feels welcome. I think that immediately technology puts up a barrier for people and it makes people, geez, Tess and I were with partners earlier today. And the second we use the word metaverse, the conversation ground a little bit slower, let's just say, because people don't just lean in naturally to these kinds of areas. But I think it is a curious industry. So, you know, we're talking about curiosity here. How do you use the curiosity to overcome that barrier? I think it's about getting people excited about the potential. So maybe there's a way to do it where it can be a much more visual way to onboard people. Let me show you what's possible. What can we create that will allow you to see, visualize, or experience what the future will be like? And don't you want to play a part in that is mm -hmm. really the question I want to ask. Don't you want to create a vision, an experience for people to 
do business inside of or work together on or build together. And I think also the lack of representation from our community in the early days of the space of metaverse is something that anyone in the design industry has seen. And you can see it and has said, hey, like, you know, there's a real role in space for this skill set. And it's needed, obviously, when you go through some of the platforms. I feel like sometimes when you give people limitless possibilities, they just freak out. Mm -hmm. It's too much. It's overwhelming. Even designers like uh, I need specifications. I need a deadline. I need something to get started. And for the average business owner, like people you might have talked to earlier today, they don't want to be in a space that looks like a video game or Tron or like a planet. Like they want the replication of the real world. Quick interruption to this episode because I want to tell you all about another podcast that I think you'll enjoy. It's called Looking Forward, and it's from our good friend Ryan Anderson, who is the VP of Global Research and Insights at Miller Knoll. The show is all about the future of the workplace, particularly in the A&D industry, which you know is a topic we love here at Barriers to Entry. You got to check out Looking Forward if you're like us and want to push the conversation around what exactly works at work. The show is part of the Surround Podcast Network, just like Barriers to Entry. So go take a listen at surroundpodcasts.com or follow Looking Forward wherever you get your podcasts. And this is where I feel like really awesome applications for designers are going to come into play here because designers need to design virtual conference rooms, virtual spaces that replicate what we have in the real world first, because you have to slowly hold Mm -hmm. people's hand and walk them into this experience very slowly. Yeah. From a mass adoption. Yes. We talk a lot about this at Digby, actually. Something that Andrew says a lot is that, you know, if you're to walk into a metaverse boardroom, there's a table and chairs. And it's not so much that, I mean, I'm stealing your line, Andrew. This is actually absolutely yours. It's not that we need that in a metaverse, but it's that we need to understand how to orient ourselves in a room full of people for that meeting and for that purpose. Taking it from 10,000 feet and bringing it down and speaking about true application, we have so many clients that are investing millions of dollars in their physical spaces and in the culture, the return to work conversation about how do we bring people back? Well, we may never go back full time or we may, but how do we express that culture in the virtual sense in extension to our physical spaces? I've been talking to a lot of designers who are just really curious about the possibilities. They want to understand like how they can showcase their work in the space, which I think is really the first step to being able to work with a business to develop a virtual conference room, show off what you can do digitally. And a lot of them already have the files and it's not that difficult to really get it into a virtual like metaverse type environment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a matter of having these conversations. And really that's what I'm trying to do with Tonic is Speak to as many designers as possible to get them excited about these possibilities and have them understand that this is a whole new potential business model for them. There's so much that they can do. It's not tech for tech's sake. It's how do we solve a problem that you have at your business? Are you having trouble getting people back to the office? Let's figure out a way to solve that. So are you having trouble getting clients to see your work online? Let's come up with a solution for that. I think it was McKinsey came out and said that the consumer of the future expects this experience from retail. And it was something 73 percent and it was millennial and younger. And they're fully expecting that businesses are evolving. But what would you say, though, to someone who maybe feels intimidated by the fact that we're early? And what if someone, a designer or a firm is not ready today, but is curious tomorrow? Is there such thing as not coming in at the right time? I think you just don't want to be really late because Mm -hmm. you don't want to be in the situation where you're scrambling to figure out how to get all your team members on a Zoom meeting to just have a normal business meeting online during a pandemic. So I think there is exploration. There's education. There are lots of things you can do in your company where you're not actively building something, but you're talking to people about it. And you're exploring it with your team and you're asking your team what they might need or want or what are the opportunities for this technology within our company? You're absolutely right, Jamie, because irrespective of a leadership team's comfortability or how bullish they may be about Web3, every business is going to have somebody who works at that company who is geeking out about Web3. And they probably have some ideas about how their business might be able to take advantage of the landscape. 
And that's a great person to listen to because at some point you have to take that first step and understand what is the opportunity for my business. Isn't it the worst though, when the person Bobby just described isn't even paid attention to, right? They're there and they're, they're doing yep. a side project and it's not even something that's part of the conversation, that company, because they don't feel like they can bring it to their work. Yeah. And I, I think because we're in a situation where there really is no right answer, there's no wrong answers either. So having a brainstorming meeting with your team about what could happen within your company is super valuable to have everybody participate just because there is no right or wrong answer at this point. And you can just figure it out together. Do you think that cultural piece is hard for some organizations to say that there is no right or wrong answer? Absolutely. I think there's probably ego involved. There's probably boards and investors and other things that you have to answer to. But within a company, I think it's really important to have great communication with your team. So even if you're in a smaller leadership role and you're just speaking with your immediate team, it could start there. And then that team could say, hey, senior leadership, we've got this idea. We'd love for you to hear it. And just getting heard is the first step. Wonderman Thompson, I mean, not to keep quoting all of these consultancy documents, but- I'm quoting everybody today, Tess, it's great. Well, these are important stats and I love a good stat, but they had interviewed a bunch of senior leadership and executives and they were aware of Web3 and all of the things and emerging tech. I mean, this included, of course, like AI and, and VR and all these other platforms as well. Their biggest constraint they felt was not having the resources or the support to be able to do this internally. And the second thing is that if they didn't, they didn't know where to turn to look for these resources and support. Do you think that's kind of a call to the industry to to start to be able to be that voice? Well, yeah, I do. And I also think you have to ask your team like, hey, do you want to learn about this? Great. I'll get you some education. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things online. There's lots of webinars and education programs. I know there's some LinkedIn certification stuff. I think Wharton is doing some business stuff in Web3. So I, there's resources out there to learn it. Nobody's really an expert mm -hmm. in any of this stuff right now. So there is opportunity for people to step up and say, you know what, I'm really curious and interested. Teach me like, hey, company, I want to be this person that starts this division in our company or leads this charge. You're so right, Jamie. I mean, we, we've seen over the summer several large brands in our industry hire or elevate heads of Web3 or create Web3 departments. I remember my first job, I was the company's first social media coordinator. And now what brand doesn't have a digital marketing or social media marketing department? And it's probably about the right time in the next one or two years for businesses really to take seriously the idea of when I look at my hiring roadmap, I need an individual who's responsible for pushing our organization in the right direction so that we are well positioned when we're no longer, quote unquote, early on Web3. It's interesting, too, because we keep saying early and no doubt we are, but we as an industry are a little bit behind. If you look at fashion and you look at art, I mean, they've been doing this for a few years now and they've rode this wave of the high and the low of the NFT and, you know, they're redefining themselves and the utility and their new revenue streams. It's very successful. I mean, as manufacturers and as architects and designers. We can really look at everything they've done, right or wrong, but we maybe don't need to be so afraid. We've watched people go through and make mistakes already and then learn. I think if you want to be successful, you cannot be afraid of failing. I have failed so many times and I'm still here to tell you that I will probably fail here and there again, make lots of mistakes. I'll make all the mistakes and then I'll tell you like not to make them because I did them all. You just can't be afraid of that. And I think you can see what's been successful. But that might not even apply to your industry, right? So while Instagram might want to do be real, maybe their customers don't want that. So it might not make sense for you to do a, an NFT drop to your community. It might make sense for you to build a virtual space where they can interact. So I think it's just figuring out what's going to work for your business and your customers instead of following someone else's lead. It starts to turn into a bit of an analysis paralysis. Well, am I, too, am I, am I not early enough? Am I too late now? What happens if I do something and... No, just I'm... start. Just start. Just do something. Anything. A great example of that is how long have we been talking about the trade show of the future now? Every year there's a panel, there's a hum about what's this trade show going to look like next year? How will it be augmented? What does Web3 look like for this trade show? And I feel like at some point 
you need to say, all right, I'm going to put a stake in the ground and say, this is what the future means for my business. Or at least let me try something out that's a little bit funky this year and see where this might take us. I think people just want their feet not to hurt as much as part of the trade show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if someone could figure yes. out how to innovate footwear yeah. that allows us to glide <laughs> yeah. along all There's day. There's many solutions there. It reminds me of back in the old Web2 days, I was on a marketing association, the mobile council. And every single year for multiple years, we're like, it's going to be the year of mobile. It's going to be the year of mobile. We said it every single year until it was like, oh, wait, it was actually two years ago. It just sort of happens. People just sort of adopt things. And if you're waiting around for it to happen, it'll pass you by. Yeah. And I think getting outside of your regular bubble of conversation, because as we've been talking about a little bit, these algorithms are in control of what we see here every day online and what we read. Even if you just follow two or three people in a completely different realm, you'll be fed a lot of new information. I'm a big proponent of getting outside of your bubble, stepping outside, seeing what else is out there, and then thinking about how it might apply to whatever it is that you're doing in your business. There are people out there definitely who are telling us what this will be. I think we are a little too early to know exactly what this will be. In 2006, we never would have been calling LinkedIn the fun place to be. But here we are 16 <laughs> years later, right? So I think we also have to consider the fact that there are even as much as we're talking about community and decentralization and all these very wonderful things, people have business motives behind what they're saying. So when you do step aside of your bubble and you learn a little, start to expand out even further is what I would say. And that's why I think conversations like what you're doing here are really important because there's no real answer. If someone's telling you exactly what something is definitely going to be, I would say that's a red flag. And to say, well, wait, let me look at it from this perspective. Or have you ever thought about it like this? To put it fundamentally, too, I mean, the perfect example is the debate of wearables and or non-wearables. There are a lot of glasses in development and there's a lot of screens in development. So I can see it going kind of both ways or all of it. <laughs> you know, there's no right answer. I don't know. But I would love to see all of the options because I like options. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of wearing a headset. So glasses are great, but I might not want to wear glasses eight hours a day. I might want to sit in front of a screen or walk into a room that has immersive technology built into the walls and then the whole thing transforms and I'm in a room with like 16 other people. So I, I think we'll see a lot of iterations of that and some companies will be really successful at it and others will not and we'll just have to wait and see. But I can envision all of those options. So Jamie, you're an NFT artist among, as we know, many other things and you're Digital Sandworms collection, for example, is on OpenSea. What got you into NFT art and where are you excited to continue to experiment there? Well, my whole Web3 journey started with NFT art. So I was curious because I had been doing art on my iPad for a long time, trying to figure out what to do with all this digital work that I was making. And I fell down a rabbit hole on Twitter, met a lot of NFT artists, got immersed in that community fairly early last April, minted probably 200 NFTs or even more than that. And yeah, it's been such an awesome opportunity. And that's kind of how I got introduced to everything and how I've met all of these really interesting and fascinating people in the world of Web3. And at some point during that art journey, the business wheels started to turn in my brain. And so that that's why I'm here now. <laughs> Love speaking with you. I think it's always so fascinating to hear what you're learning and, and what you're doing and what you're passionate about. And so for our listeners, where would you point them for resources or anything that could help them in this journey? Well, obviously, this podcast is the best resource, right? That's the correct answer. Thank you. <laughs> Follow me on LinkedIn would be also <laughs> really fantastic. If you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, there's a lot of conversations in Web3. So get on there, do a search, see who the top followers are, start listening in on Twitter. Same thing. There's a lot of conversations happening there as well. You could even consider joining a, a Web3 community. And there's a lot of education and connections that you can make there as well. Just get out there and do a Google search. Type in Web3 in any of your social media platforms. You could also follow Tonic at Tonic underscore XYZ on Twitter and Instagram mm -hmm. or join the community. We'd love it. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jamie. It was such a pleasure having you on today. Can't wait to see the next LinkedIn post and everything else that comes from all your great work. Jamie's great, isn't she? I think I think we all can vote that we love we love Jamie and it was great having her on as our first guest and we play with time a lot in this magical world of, of recording here at Sandow. But uh, 
that was actually our first podcast recording that we did. That was that was legitimately all of us on our, our rookie voyage there, our maiden voyage. So what we like to do after each episode is share a quick takeaway or something that stuck with us um, in the days and weeks that followed the interview. So I'll go first. And I really, you know, as somebody who works in the digital space, thought it was a super interesting Jamie proclaiming the death of social media and it's being replaced by recommendation media. Um, and as somebody who's still wrapping their mind around, you know, the opportunities that the decentralization technologies that form the bedrock of Web3 present and getting away from recommendation media and the endless scroll, it gives me hope for the ways in which creative people will try to unlock metaverses and, and Web3 and, and so on. I was really inspired by her telling us like, just try, you know, like she said in the very beginning when we first talked to her, I don't know where I'm going to end in this, but I do know that I'm following a thread and I'm following the energy and it's brought her to tonic. What she's presenting is just a mindset that really allows you to not worry about what the technology is that might get in your way and not, not worry about the how at the outset. It's really just about learning and about, you know, building the community around you as well. I think that one of the other really surprising outcomes and maybe one of our favorite uh, side jokes from the episode was just the degree to which Jamie's really leaning into LinkedIn and how LinkedIn has become this broadly powerful platform for anyone who's looking to learn about this new Web3 space and, and the intersections between design uh, between architecture, between Web3 and the metaverse are just apparent every single day on that platform. So it's something really exciting to hear her talk about and how she really got in. And that's really why we called this first episode Curiosity 101. By the way, I, I do want to go back for a second and note that LinkedIn's not the sponsor of this podcast. <laughs> no, but if they'd like true. to sponsor, they mm-hmm. can contact our producer, Sam Sager, and learn more. All right, let's let's close this out. A big thank you to our production team, Sam Wise, Hannah, and the whole team at the studio by Sandow. Barriers to Entry is a part of the Surround Podcast Network, so make sure that you go to surroundpodcast.com, that's podcasts with an S, and be sure to smash that follow button. Uh, that's what the kids say now, right? Smash. Be relentless. Be relentless. You actually only need to do it once. It's a very gentle click, but we'd love it if you could share the podcast. We have more exciting episodes to come. Thanks to Bornado. Shouts to Bornado for us being in person today. Join us next time as we continue to break down the barriers to entry. Discover more with Surround, a podcast network from Sandow Design Group, featuring the architecture and design industry's go-to shows. Surround is the hub for creative conversations, endless inspiration, and design resources. Hear from tastemakers, researchers, designers, and architects themselves. Trending now on Surround is The Mic from NYC by Design, hosted by Debbie Melman. Learn more at surroundpodcasts.com.